15, 20 years I've been involved in personal transformation work. I've taken it and lightened it to do team building, but we do what I call real team building, not games and jumping castles. And we've had astounding, yes sir. As, okay, so number one for me, don't enter a race, become second. Number two, integrity. So, uh, fundamentally, good morning. Fundamentally, guys like Alarms Armstrong and those guys that take drugs, yes, they want to be the best, but it's an ego best that I'm better than you versus I'm the best I can be. Do you understand that difference? I'm not into drugs. If you're better than me, cool. But I'll still I'll use that as an energy to get me to bring out my best. But I'm not going to go to take drugs and stimulants and testosterone and all of those kind of things because that violates my second value of integrity. I'm a boy scout. And in our world, I think we're losing, we're missing integrity. You know, in the whole of Africa, that's, that for me is the, we don't have the fabric of trustworthiness. Good morning, thanks for being here. So, if you know your values, and most people don't know their top three values. I know my number one value is freedom. My number one value in life is time freedom, money freedom, life freedom. But that's my life. But in a workplace, I have my values. And to be the best, do what it takes. Put in the effort. Don't, don't, don't do half a job. So that's for me the focus. So for the personal, the, the mindset, the individuals, I have a system. There's some CDs there. It's called Formula One. And if you take the one and turn around, it goes for now. Because that's all you have. Well, you, you can't change yesterday. You can't change tomorrow. You've got now. How are you doing with now? And most people don't live now. They're, they're carrying baggage. And I was in a meeting with somebody, and it was around this whole racial thing. And they were angry at me. And I said, like, whoa, hold on. Like, what's the story? You know, I, I wasn't the one. You know, I'm just a, a soul in the dance. I, I, we were talking this morning. Out of 11 chances I've had to vote, I've voted three times in my life. I was oblivious of most of the stuff. But this woman was angry at me for stuff that happened. And I'm saying, but hold on, like, handle me, the, the, the soul and the people, don't handle a perception. So, mindset, I think, is so important. Psychological capital, we talk about financial capital, but we're missing natural capital, we're missing psychological capital. And at the end of the day, if your life's only about money, I think it's a very shallow life. So I have a very powerful system, and I've now taken the time to build a revolutionary workplace, because from the time you wake up in the morning, no one is saying, it lasts two hours. So, you know, like five in the morning till seven, eight at night is for work. But how many people wake up and say, yay, I'm going to work. It's like, oh, you know, you know good God, it's morning, or good, good morning, God. You know, but most people that say, oh, good God, it's morning again. And I think the, the numbers are about 50 to 60% are open to, to move a job. Because they're not happy where they are. And that's crazy stuff. And it's just for money for some shareholders. And I think that model's timing is done. And then ClearX is the framework and, and the process based on the world's best that I've been able to find around high performance. So let's take you through. I thought I'd put this up because you don't know me, number one, other than my introduction, unless you've done a bit of research for me online. But I've been an invisible expert. And I've designed it like that because just that's how I am. I'm not a big, loud, shouted out, Donald Trump kind of guy. I do the most powerful stuff in the world. I'm probably one of five that can do what I can do. And I'm not the shouter. My clients shout for me. So, IDT, Independent Development Trust, Ayanda Wakaba, we call him Wakes. We did a weekend workshop. I didn't know about this until they got me the second time and Dion said, the financial <coughs> manager said, the reason why we're choosing you is after that weekend we worked with you, we took our business from 200 million a year to 800 million a year. I thought, that's good stuff. <laughs> like, why don't you tell me? Um, uh, 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 Oxford Conference Center and Lavelle Packaging, the lady looked around, she said they were looking for one person to bring a holistic solution, but they didn't think, they didn't think they could find it. They gave me the opportunity, a weekend workshop. 
um, Alison, then I went back again the second time, and she said, you need to know that we've gone from 30 million a year to 50 million a year from what we did with you. And that's just the people side. I don't do the business, the marketing, the sales, just people, building the people. Um, you know, so we've done life changing. Office of the Public Protector, you might know Office of the, the Public Protector, before Tudi was there, Tudi for president. Um, but I did 13 workshops around the country, 12 for staff and then a management one, a second level, because I've got five levels that you go through. Um, to sell the guy said, he said, he said, I've seen miracles happen. He was with me at every workshop. He said, I didn't believe you could do what you've done, but I've seen miracles where people were treating each other like dogs. And now we've got a very new dynamic, a new culture, a new energy. So these kind of things, life-changing, um, Coca-Cola, we did for Impala Platt, we did the whole senior team. But I use a four-letter word. I was at a workshop preparation before we do the event. And the lady that was engaging me, she said, please don't use that word. I thought I'd sworn. I said, what word? She said, don't use that word love. So I said, why? She says, you lose all credibility with my directors. Now these are accountants. <laughs> and I said, that's crazy. And so I interviewed every one of them before the event. And I started the morning session because I had a bit of rapport with them from the phone call. And I said, I want to tell you that I'm, you're probably the most intelligent group I've ever been in front of. IQ. But you're probably the most stupid from an EQ. And it's like... And at the very end of the workshop, the big boss came and said, you're right. He said, you know what, we lost our soul. So the only thing that matters for them is a number. And he said, that's why we have a problem with our staff because we are so left brain numerically oriented. And that engineers have the challenge and accountants and, and lawyers. But we've missed the human part of business. And that's what I, my goal is to, to bring back love. And you'll see in revolutionary, there's L-O-V-E in reverse. So I've got to hide it so, so that people don't sit over here. You know, men, men have a problem saying, you know, love. But shouldn't, shouldn't just want love to come to work? Shouldn't they love what they do? You know, so for me, bringing that, that real passion, that energy, that interest of, of having a great place to work is so important. I think the shifts that we're having in the world with the technology and the internet is we've, we've gone through different ages, except the time now is it's happening very much quicker. Before you could have 20 year plans, strategic plans, today you can't have a 20 year strategic plan, you, you, know, you might have a 2 to 5 kind of vision, and then in 6 months a competitor jumps the fence with technology, um, and your, your strategy is out of the window. So, we've got to come to the scene of purpose and meaning. The new kids coming through, the new generations, from my generation is kind of work, until you die. The new kids today, they want balance. That's got, there's, no, there's got to be meaning. It can't just be for money, money, money. There's got to be something beyond just trying to work for money. So the new generation, the leadership styles, the expectations, the demands are very, very different. And so I think in most workshops, in most businesses, you've got at least four generations. And that's where part of this, this conflict is coming. The old leadership trying to hold, hold to the command and conquer. And the new ones are you know, the self-managed teams. So we need something beyond that for that shift. Just from your perspective, I'd like to get an understanding. What is your biggest challenge with people? What do you think is your biggest challenge around people? Attitude. Mindset. Mm -hmm. Communication, understanding, tolerance. Mindset as well. And isn't it crazy that when you employ somebody, we have got no process to assess their mindset? And that there's no training for mindset. I think it's crazy, absolutely crazy. Yeah, but it's like, I would very be placing those questionnaires that is on during interviews. And it doesn't really give an accurate reflection of the person. The challenge that you have is the person coming for the interview wants the job. That's why they're there. They're going to write what they think you want to see. And so they're very easily manip manipulative in the process. They can manipulate what they put down, and it's not necessarily a true reflection. But in your interviewing, you've got to ask questions and say, you know, you, you put a 7 out of 10 for a, for a leadership initiative. Give me two examples where you did this. So you can't just read the assessment 
and say, well, that's what they are. You've got to now back it up and say, now, give me the true examples. Mm -hmm. What happened? What were the circumstances? What was your thinking pattern? Unfortunately, when people are coming for a JOB, they're going to do what they can to get it. And so I think you have to have a filter. Oh, wait, good morning. Good morning, morning. You have to have a filter to, to do a deeper check. But these are the kind of problems that most businesses have. Every business has them. When I do my team development, uh, we do pre-event pre assessments, we do phone calls, we do post-event assessment. So it's like a circular <coughs> process. Trust is a very big issue. Um, lack of communication, lack of connection, you know, misunderstandings. We are very intolerant. We, I find that you know, with, with our politics being so visible and so close to the ground in the business, even in the business, there's separation and, and conflict um, based on that alone. So every company has it, every team has it, and even us, we have it. Um, we have stress issues, we have internal conflicts. So, but a big thing is this talent. You know, talents. As, as technology gets sharper and more complex, you need more intelligent people. And so finding really good talent and keeping them is going to become an increasingly big, uh, bigger challenge for you. So for me, the, the process is, why have you done this system? Why, why this revolutionary workplace? And it's for three things. We have to do something to build our people. The old style of doing the people process has to change. Number two, planet, we have a finite resource and we are wasting it at a speed that is, until you actually understand the consequences of what we're doing, it is quite scary. What really kind of activated me even more on this is a woman called Ellen McCarthy, she, she's about this big. She raced around the world on a trimaran yacht. The mast is a hundred foot tall. This thing that flies, it's an incredible machine. But now she wants to break the world record, so you've got to, you have constraints. You can't take unlimited fuel, unlimited fuel, unlimited fuel. She wants to beat the record, so she had to plan her fuel down to the liter. She had to plan her food down to the day. And she said only when she's out at sea and the next nearest town was two and a half thousand kilometers away did she suddenly realize how this finite resource is actually so important that she gave, she gave up sailing completely to now travel the world and she's talking around this thing called a circular economy, which I'll share with you. But it's understanding. We have finite resources, whether it's air, oil, uh, you know, ground, our natural resources. But we are wasting them and things have to change. We cannot keep on abusing the planet. I read a very, very interesting document. If the companies, the top companies, had to pay for the natural resources they are abusing, air, water, stuff like that, they wouldn't make a profit. But they're stealing from us so that they can make money. That's it. Just so that another director or shareholder can have more money in the bank, another zero. What are our children going to say when there's no food? When there's no water, what do you tell them? I didn't know. What do we tell them? And then profit. Obviously, profit's an important issue. Um, that's the, the fuel of business. And for me, I think there's got to be a shift in business from profit, profit, profit to people, planet, and profit. That, those have to be the triple bottom line because for, for the sake of just making more money to destroy all other resources, I think is insane, and we cannot continue on with that process. This is a graph, it's not too clear here, but this is global population. Do you know how many are on the planet today? Seven, Seven and a half billion. By 2050, on the current trajectory of about 2 point something percent, we will be at close to 10 billion. Think about that. It's not going to be another 3 billion spread out evenly. It's going to be another 3 billion in our cities. Imagine doubling our population in our country. Africa is roughly a billion today. It will be 2 billion, if not close to 3. As it is, we don't have food. We don't have water. We don't have resources. We don't have work. For a billion. So we have constraints, 
we have a variety of constraints, but we've been wait we're waiting for government to make the move. And for me, I'm sorry, I'm brutal. I don't think they have the competence or the capacity to do what we need. I just don't think so. I think they're there for greed. But I call greedership. In the old days, you could rely on them to do the, the stuff that you needed, the infrastructure stuff. I don't think we've got enough thought leadership and enough willpower to do stuff that's for the greater good. It's just like, see, money, 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 money. So, you know, racism and politics, I think mean, trust is an issue. I don't think we've got really good integrity leaders, good role models in the, in the world. The millennials and the generation workers, <coughs> these kids coming through are very different. You can't just say it is because. If you're going to be employing them, in the next few years they're going to be half of your, half of your organization. And they've got a very different mindset, very different way of working. I think we've got a bit more consciousness in business, so that business isn't just a machine that you're running. That there's actually, I want to bring more soul into business because we kind of are, are, are somewhere between. But we know that stress causes most illness. So the, the stress and the illness that the work creates now goes into your medical health system, which the public are paying for. So once again, it's not necessarily a natural resource, but it's extra load factor because of the, the kind of stresses. I was, because of the, the self-development healing work that I do, I was quite interested in the suicide. We are 23rd out of 107 countries in suicide rate. 22 people a day manage to kill themselves, 200 try a day in our country. That's what we, we know about. Why? I think it's iniquitous that we have that kind of thing. Our crime, we're the highest in the world, just about low helplessness and negative attitude of the issue of our country. In fact, it's Africa. People have been taught to be helpless. I was with Professor Stoltz, who started Adversity Intelligence, AQ. You know, EQ is important. IQ gets you on the field. EQ is about managing the people. AQ is about being able to take the punch and get back up and keep on going. So, you need all three of them. But they did tests. They had a box, and there was an electrical charge in the box, and they put the dog in the box. And they, charged, they put a charge through it, so obviously they got electrocuted. But the dog couldn't go anywhere. So after a certain number of times, they then put it in a similar box, but there was a little, a, a small fence, and if it wanted to, it could jump across to safety. You know that most of the dogs just stood there and didn't change. They'd be taught. Doesn't matter what you do, just take the punch. And just and so that they get taught to give up. And that's a fundamental foundation of mindset. And so people will kind of pretend and they'll think they're doing, but they're not using their full potential. And then in Africa that's a huge, huge problem. In our country, all my team buildings and stuff. And when I work with Professor Stoltz, they do all the, all the, like, the cognitive, yes, no, this, no, that control and, um, and ownership and stuff means this. I do the inner work, and I get three times the kind of impact that they get, and it lasts longer. And so for me, this whole thing of learned helplessness, if we don't start to change that air up in the communities, they will eventually find a way. You can't keep on making a higher wall to keep people up. You know, it's, it only gets, makes the divide worse and worse, and the, and the roof bigger and bigger, and eventually it's got to explode somewhere. But within an organization, meaning has to change. People don't want to just work for money. Engagement, global average is 20% are engaged, Gallup research. 65% are just there, just so because they get their salary. And 15% are disengaged. They're the negative, they're the cancer. I was shocked to discover South Africa is a 35% average disengagement. And they are actively destroying your organizational performance, culture, energy dynamic. Mm -hmm. Productivity issues, turnover. You know, for me, the, the shift between maximization and optimization. Maximize utilizes the resource until it's finished, cloth throw it away. Optimization uses it at an intelligent level so that you have long-term use from it. And I think that's got to be the shift for us. So the real question is, are your staff an advantage for you or are they a disadvantage for you? Now, I've worked with people and they've got a hundred staff and they say it's like having a hundred kindergarten kids. <coughs> it's amazing the kind of bickering that starts. 
And you go to, you can walk into a company, you can feel the culture, and you can feel the kind of dynamic that's there. And then you listen to the conversations. And for most of them, they're negative. It's kind of the, the women are together in their little bitchy groups, and, and the guys are together, and they're split by race and by politics and that. And it's just, it's, it's a very divisive place. And you spend more time at work than at home with people you love. Why not have a great place to work? Why not have a connection that's, you know, you spend years working with people. The one, the one thing we did with Impala Platts, the guy said, I've known this woman for 14 years. I didn't know she had these kind of problems. So I think we've got to know people a whole lot better. So to get results, the results are all controlled by mindset. If you have the wrong mindset to start, it doesn't matter what resources you've got, what tools you've got, it doesn't matter. Because that's going to control how you feel, what kind of mood you're in, what kind of state you live in. And that, once again, controls your thoughts and pictures, and will control what you say, and that will control how you feel, and that will predispose you or limit you to action. We're not a high productivity country. We're not. People are, their default mode is to go and sit and relax. We don't have, like, you know, let's get to it. Let's, how can we do something new? We don't have high innovation. It's kind of more conflict protect. I ask this question in a workplace. When you wake up in the morning, you get 100 units of energy. How much of that energy do you use for preservation and protection at work? Do you know what the average answer is? 75 to 80 percent for preservation and protection in the workplace. I think it's crazy. How do they even get work done? <laughs> so for me, the process goes beyond, you know, people send, people want improved results, so they need information on action, so they send them to workshops, on, we do lots of training for skills. We spend billions on skills. So now less than 10% or 12% of skills, knowledge, from the workshop is applied back in the workplace. I think that's crazy, but that's the research. You can improve that to about 75% if you add coaching to the model. And that's why Emmanuel's coaching and the stuff that we do that helps with that. But if you really want to create change, you want to go below, below this line and get into the identity of who the person is and their programs and, and their experience. You know, if, if you've gone through something, if a dog's bitten you, you're scared of dogs. If you've had a hard childhood, you, I mean, you come with a mindset that's victim, poor me. Poor me, gimme, gimme. I've seen people in a weekend change from this poor me to, you know, well, not widely, but try me. And that's the shift that's going to happen. It's because that's the foundation of all life. How you see the world, how you see a challenge. What, what you're here to do for the planet. That gives you the power and the focus and the energy to go through any storm, through any rejection, through anything. But where do you get that training at work? Nobody trains you on that. I'm able to predict people's future, and it's very easy because it's based on research. <laughs> most people want to be here, but most people live here. And most of your staff are going to be down here. From 65 onwards, there's a big problem because we're now living longer. The problem with Medicine and technology is now, average age duration is up. Now there's age extending beer. There, there are people, well, think of it, what's the oldest person you know alive? 94, 96. So, how are you going to fund from 60 to 100? We might be, we, we're lucky, we're in the top. 10% of quality of life on the planet. How, how are they going to live? There's dog food in their future. Yeah. Is that fair? With, with the machine and opportunity? And so for me, business is going to become a better force for good. So we need to change the mindset. We've got to change how people approach the world. What the whole function of businesses for me has got to be beyond just money, 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 money. We know our research shows that Employers now globally, 90% of managers know that they need better mindsets. But they don't have a way of checking that. 
We know that the right mindset to make you individually up to 7.3 times more valuable, and if you release it, <coughs> 4 times more valuable than normal. What are you doing about mindset? We want more valuable people. We want people with initiative, with good decision making, with good integrity. There's a lot of values that we need and mindset skills that we need. But where do people get it? If we don't talk about it, if we don't develop it, where do we get those? So you know the story about the elephant sitting at the at the circus, this huge big elephant, and there's a little uh, little chain around it or a piece of rope around its ankle. Could it get away if it wanted to? Absolutely. Why not? It's been taught to be helpless. And most people have been taught that. Don't try it. It's a waste of time. The American pike is exactly the same kind of fish. They put the fish in a glass tank, divide it in half, the pike on this side and its favorite little food on this side, little fishies. The pike tries to get, hits the glass every time, smashes its snout. Eventually it learns to give up. It's been taught to be helpless. They take the glass out of the middle, these little fish will swim around and it will die. Because in its mindset, it's been set, given. People are very simple creatures, to love and be loved. Core human need. That's the, the fundamental, when somebody wins, voice of whatever, who do they find first? Mommy or dad. We are simple souls. Love and connection. Some certainty, we want some uncertainty. Significance drives a huge amount of us. These are, these are ego needs. Contributing and growth are the two needs of your soul. How many of your workplaces support that? How many of your leaders understand that? How, how many of your managers manage with that in mind? Do you want to get the best out of people? Understand how they work. Most people don't understand how people work. They don't even understand how, how their, their own self works. And so what planet? You know, when I look at this little blue marble, a long time ago, 20 years ago, I wanted to write an article, Life Rafts Don't Have Life Rafts. Because I watched the guy in the ocean, they'd been out there for like 29 days, their lips were smashed, and it, it's hard out there in the ocean. It's salt water, you can't drink water, it's hard. But our little blue marble is exactly the same. There's limited resources. When we run out of water, fresh water, 2%. Really good places in our country about the water. We should be in by bottle. Now there's places in the mountains where the water is now it's, um, melting and going down into the rivers, into the oceans. All of the, the normal water up in the north and south pole, it's fresh water going into the oceans. We have, we, we're going to have a huge challenge with that. So our, our plan is, <coughs> this is water stress by country, our country, maximum water stress, the whole country. We were talking driving here, when I brush my teeth, I take some water, I put, it, put the paste on, I switch off the water and I brush my teeth, when I'm finished I switch it on and I rinse. The other people, I just let the water run. You know, liters and liters and liters. I used to... I'm still I'm going to make a plan now, but when you switch on a shower and it's cold water, and you know, at 11 o'clock at night, I'm not going to stand in the cold water. But I'm thinking, here's five liters I'm wasting. And the problem is that people, like the best of them are saying, in, a, in, the, in the locations, and I've seen on the side of the road, there are these fire hydrants, the water's just running. Thousands of liters. I've always been saying, next world war, water. We can't just make it. We can't just carry it. It's heavy. Water. We are making CO2 with our new... We're planning to get our, our nuclear device, our six nuclear stations. Absolute suicide. Already Fukushima, the Russian, all, all of that stuff. America, there's already three. If you go and do the measurements right now in the ocean, Fukushima radiation is already on the west coast of America. Now we want to have six of those in our country run by who? One of them goes, where do we go? Mexicans film really, really well. But the amount of oxygen it uses and the amount of CO2 it puts into the ocean, if you look at it, look how quickly this is this is grown and it just it just goes. Because of that, everything around us is heating up. 
the faster the, the ocean heats up, fish don't don't survive too well in some in hot in hotter waters. But the whole planet gets hotter, which means all the water in the poles is melting faster and faster. And the faster it melts, the faster it melts. That's that same graph again. But in 20, 2002, we had a 1% increase from when we started measuring. In two, now 2018, we're at 2%. 2032 at 3. Sorry, that, that's at full 2%. But at 2070 odd, we're at 4%. A 4% increase in heat on the planet is suicide. Your children are done. They will have nothing. Oceans will be up one and a half meters. Understand the consequence of that. It's going to push people from, from the existing land back into towns. Whatever our towns are, we're going to be double. Imagine, how many people in, in Khartoum? <coughs> 10 million? Imagine 20 million people with no food and no water. It's coming. Your children are going to, this is what your children are going to live in. It's not maybe, it's coming. Because the problem that you have, it's, it's like these ocean going liners, you know these big ocean tankers? There's huge oil with hundreds of thousands of tons. I don't know, what, I wanted to research, I didn't check it. But at least like half an hour to an hour before they crash, they know they're going to crash. They can't stop. The momentum is just so big. We're exactly the same here, we've overshot the mark. Who's going to stop it? Government? You're right. Who's going to have some sanity and say, whoa! Global surface temperature projection to be up by in your children's lifetime. They're going to look back and say, you have screwed the pooch. Thank you. Food. From 2006 to 2050, we need 70% more food on the, on the current projections. And all the research shows that those projections don't fit. The models aren't big enough for what we're going through. Ocean, ocean rise. 1.4 meters at least. And this is, this is what they are peddling as the kind of, no, don't worry, it won't be that bad. Politicians will peddle anything. Here's the riding the razor graph that, uh, that we spoke about. Profits, it's harder, it's more competitive. People are struggling. 95% of small businesses don't make it. The big profit margins of the old days, unless you've got a BE, Tenderpreneur that you've got a connection with a cousin or an uncle with a buddy. Those profit margins out in the normal world are dwindling. Very much harder. Social media, Zmart, internet. You know, you can stand at a shop. We did this. My, my fiance at the time wanted some uh, running shoes. Checked. The guy said they're fourteen ninety five. Thank you. I paid. Same model. 8.95 Pretoria, 9.95 down the road. Thank you, bye. <laughs> I went to the 9.95 guy and said, listen, I can get it for 8.95 Pretoria, will you match the price or buy some other stuff? He said, fine. And that's, it's only going to get easier. So, profit's a challenge. Prices are falling in every single thing. This is the 3D printing. Do you know, we 3D print hearts. We 3D print houses. We are 3D printing everything. You can 3D print a gun. And so technology that used to be so expensive is so much cheaper. Your business competency in 1984, if you studied XYZ engineering degree in 1984, was valid for 30 years. Today that, that knowledge is valid for four, in fact it's less. You're going to have to re-educate yourself every three to four years, completely, to stay up with the trend, with the technology. Do you know they've got little nanobots that will go into your heart now and do heart operations? They've got things that will go in and they'll tell you what cancer markers you've got in your blood. The technology that's coming is absolutely astounding. Zmod, zero moment of truth. Before people come and buy your product or service, they make 80% of their decision and they haven't even spoken to you. How do you as a business compete with that? How do you make sure that you're visible? You can't, just all have to be the ones out there. We need much more entrepreneurial stock. We need better stock. They need to be outstanding salespeople. They have to be innovative and creative and, and agile and flexible enough to handle what's in front of them. You can't be the one and be the wizard of all the knowledge and have some half-educated guys at the gate anymore. Yeah, 
You know, you <coughs> take a picture, you go, it'll give you the list of the nearest places in the nearest process. Margins are dying. Margins are that riding the razor. You, you can't run a business by cutting price the whole time. Business needs entrepreneurial, even in big business. The new world is social, high IQ social skills. I read in Australia, in 10 to 15 years, 40% of their workforce is going to be replaced by advanced technology, AI, robots. And I was thinking about it. You know, you employ somebody because you have a need. If you can fill that need with a machine that doesn't sleep, that doesn't go on strike, that doesn't need leave, that doesn't have babies, you're going to do it. That just creates bigger gaps in our country for non-skilled, low-skilled, no-skilled to even get up onto the platform. It's a huge challenge. We need flexibility, agile. You know, we're in this knowledge social economy. We, if we took the money that we're wasting in our country and put it to give everybody free internet access. When I was in Hong Kong 20 years ago, I picked up a phone, dial, it's free. Imagine if we had free. If you're starting a business, anybody starting a business here? That's thousands just for the phone bill. You know, if, you, if you want to stimulate entrepreneurship and business, free internet, free phone. That's a start. Will someone do it? Let's see. Social media. That 50, are you? Are you? Uh, I, I didn't do the T. There's meant to be a T. Are you a twit? Because Twitter and Facebook and social media has huge impact. In the old days, you could screenshot and do what you want with your stuff. Today, they just go onto Facebook and they make a little comment about you. You know, people people are being fired for racist comments or sexist comments or bad behavior. You know. The things that you were doing in private in your business now are public matters. You know, that's, that's it, that goes viral. This has got lots of lines, but the important line is the red line is where we are, the left line is where we're coming from. This blue line is resources, our, our planet's resources. And notice that, that that line is only going down. But you'll see that certain lines go up, and that's the death line. We are going to have serious volume of conflict. We cannot continue on this process. There's, there's, the, we were talking last night, the guys were saying that by the end of the year we're going to have, between the EFF and the, the current government, conflict is going to escalate to a point of inevitable. What does that do to your business market, to your business model, to the energy and the dynamic? But all of it, if you notice, lines are down, resources are down. You know, debts go down, but then they, they're going to rise. So by 2000, we still kind of, we're in the okay zone. Our kids are going to look at us with, with hate and say, you yeah, looks really didn't care much about us. We have to make changes. Because that's the problem, is we are stealing our children's future. And our children's children's future. And we're wasting it today for money. For apathy. I got excited with this because once I read that uh, Ellen MacArthur thing on her yacht, she's talking about the circular economy. And basically, the essential model of cir circular economy is no waste. Change how we design stuff so that there's no waste. I was having my printing done, and they had a whole ton of paper, these little, and they're doing binding, they were binding like, I don't know, 400,000 pages. So they had all of this paper shrapping on these little binding things, and they throw it away. But now my brain's like, how do we use this? What can we use this for? Maybe it could be used for a wedding, for, for confetti. Or maybe we could package it with some uh, paraffin and, and package it up to become blocks. Because once you start to think, now creativity happens, so you can start to give your staff meaning on how do we optimize our resources. Because what's exhaust for one business becomes input for another. Did anybody know restaurants, fish and chip shops and that? They used to struggle to get rid of that oil. It was ugly, it was dirty, they couldn't throw it down the drain. They used to have to pay people to fetch it. Do you know that, that people are now paying them to get it? Because use it for biodiesel. And so all of these new technologies that are coming, we're able to take stuff that we used to throw away. This guy was, he had a milling and the stalk of a milling for farmers. 
And he said we used to take the many, and that was the food, and this other biomass we used to throw away. But now they've got a technology using an elephant um, bacteria, elephant poo bacteria. They take the stalk, they put it through a process, it becomes biomass for diesel. And so our technologies, we've got to find ways to do sharing of this technology on a global basis so that whatever waste you've got, or your output becomes input for someone else. But not only in material, also digital. If you think of a, like a TV station, the output is a list of, of what's, what's on when. It's, it's the, that's just a byproduct. Some clever guy in America went and got all of the radios, all of the TVs, that, that output waste of theirs, the digital information, he put it into a book, and I think he sold the business for $20 million because it consolidated that information into a book as a reference point now for people to, to look at. So we've got to be innovative. We've got to find ways to, to take and have this because what we do is we mine, we refine, we make, and then we break. <coughs> the problem is we're wasting landfill. We're filling up landfill. We're wasting a ton of stuff. And they say, we've got to find a better way. We can save billions by product extension, redistribution, and remanufacturing. I heard Reynolds. Reynolds is also part of Nissan. They have a, a re, remanufacturing arm where they take gearboxes and bits and pieces. They remanufacture it back to original standards, and then they, they either use it or they sell it out. It is their most profitable division of the entire organization. It is coming to us. The circular economy, where we design differently. So think about it. Anybody got a washing machine? When it's broken, what do you do? Guy comes in to repair it. When it's broken, it gets chucked away. But maybe there's only some little tech thing but it's out of, we can't get it anymore. Yes. But imagine if that company didn't sell you the machine, they rented you a thousand washers. They bring the machine, they maintain it, they do everything, at the end of it they take it back, they've designed it so that they can use the frame and bits and pieces in the next versions, but it needs a shift in mindset, it needs to design for longevity, design for being serviced, design for remanufacture, design for recovery. There's a carpet company, they sell the make carpets. Their law, everything. This carpeting company, they, everything is made to be brought back, stripped and recycled, 100% recycled back to the next use for, um, for, for manufacture out into the market. And so this whole circular economy process is starting to become a huge part of business. And it's an opportunity for Africa and ourselves to be leaders in it because existing structures and organizations struggle to kind of change. But as we grow in our innovation, we can, we can save a huge amount of value. The problem is we are like wild frogs. Anybody ever been in a hot tub, sauna, like a nice sauna bath? Here's what happens is if you take a frog and put it into cold water and you heat it slowly, the frog, just like us, says, okay, I'll adjust, I'll accommodate, I'll, I'll make a plan. And so we're reasonable and we adjust. It will eventually get to the point of adjusting and being so reasonable that it will boil and die. We're the same. We are exactly the same. Whereas if you put that frog into boiling water, it will jump out. But think of the stuff we tolerate that shouldn't be tolerated at all, whether it's crime, politics, theft, business. We're tolerating an amazing amount of stuff. We need, we need something to boil so hot that we say, you know what, actually no. The problem is I don't think it's going to happen. We need to, the future is here. It's just not evenly spread around. But we need to be the innovators to start the process. Because 10% of the system controls the system. So I put this in for two things. It's an empathy map that we use in the workshops. What do you think your staff really think about business, about working for a boss for money? I mean, who's, it? who's got the Porsche? Lovely car. What do you think the staff, and I'll tell you why I'm asking, I'm busy doing a, a quote for a, a construction company. And I arrived there, outside is a brand new Range Rover, and there was, um, I think it was the new BM, the 8BM, 
like a million and a half car. And so I said to the woman, it'll probably cost you about 30,000 rand for this. I know, we don't have that kind of money. And I'm saying, excuse me, you got three million outside the door, in metal, and you don't have it for your business. <laughs> so what do you think staff think when, you, when they're like, you're paying them just enough, and you're driving a really lacquer car? Do you think it inspires them, motivates them, demotivates them? And I'm not saying don't have it. <laughs> I used to sell those when I was 21, I used to drive them. I've, I've, I've got them out of my blood. But what do you think staff really think on a day-to-day -day basis when they wake up in the morning? Hey? So then my question is, then why do we put our finger up their nose? If they're the ones that are running the machine. If they're the ones that are making the machine go and grow. No. Knowing what we know about life and business, how do we get the best out of people? But let's go, let's go forward, 50 years, 70 years. Now we've got double the population, we've got no water, we've got no food, you've gone, we're all died, we're, we're, the ants have taken us in our, in our graves, in our coffin. But you've got kids, I've got a little grandson, he's two now. You know, so he'll be my age when this shit hits the fan. What do you think he's going to think about me? And the problem is, we're going to have between now and 2050, we're going to get another three and a half billion people on the planet. Are we acting intelligently? Are we being smart? Are we being leaders? So for me, the goal is to become exponential. If you go to somebody and say, I want you to increase your sales by 5%, yeah, okay, I'll make an extra call or cut costs or whatever. But when you go to somebody and say, you're doing a million today, I want you to do 2 million, 5 million. Suddenly, the order of thinking has to change how you think, what you think, and the mindset has to change by a big order of magnitude. And so that for me is always the challenge is, how do you disrupt and go exponential? So, for you, where are you today? Where do you want to be? When you've come here to get something, what's the gap from where you are to where you want to be? And how are you going to get your star to jump there? For some of us, it's so easy. We've got a, we've got a mindset, we've got a rhythm, we've got a process. How do you get the rest of your team on the same page, singing off the same hymn sheet? Tolerant, connected, communicated, loving, caring, trusting. Every company I go to, trust is an issue, politics is an issue, race is an issue. BEE puts in competent people in management roles. People join a company for the vision, they leave because of their relationship with the manager. OPP. Wonderful guys. They've got an incompetent manager because of the, 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 the business process trying to run advocates. And because they know more than him, they are better qualified than him, they have more expertise than him, he now feels inadequate. So he doesn't go from assertion, he goes to aggression. And he uses his force to screw people up. So he screws up the department. And it's just a very destructive cycle. So what are the constraints that we have that are, that are going to get you to become from where you are now to double your business? To double the impact, not only business in main terms, but to double the quality of your impact on your people, on the planet, and on your profits. Could you double your business? Could you turn your staff into partners? I watched Julius talk in London. I was impressed eventually because I, I had a certain image and a